Hello and welcome to New Central TV. I am Adebola Adeduba. The headlines. World Economic Summit kicks off in Davos, Switzerland. UK Parliament set for hot debate on Rwanda asylum plan. Kenya seeks swift resolution with Tanzania after flight ban. Details shortly. News Central Now at this hour begins with Nigeria's Vice President, Kashim Shetima, speaking at the World Economic Forum holding in Davos, Switzerland. Shetima said Africa needs to take advantage of the digital revolution in the world. Shetima, while calling for investment, said rather than a country go into begging, they should seek for mutual beneficial exchange. He assured investors that the President of Nigeria, Bola Chinobo, is redefining the quality of modern leadership by taking power cited decisions. Like Nigeria, Egypt, the generally the African continent, we are in a position to really take advantage of the digital revolution in the world. For instance, Nigeria, there are more English speakers in Nigeria than in India. Our proximity to Europe is an added advantage, and most importantly, even our addiction. I will tell you a story of a young lady in, in, in Abuja. Her name is Mrs. Amal Hassan. She runs a digital lab, a digital outsourcing hub. This is a lady who has employed 7,000 Nigerians. This is just a tip of the iceberg. Opportunities abound in the outsourcing industry and in so many other uh, developing frontiers. India is expected to generate $100 billion from outsourcing alone in this 2024. Yes, we are an oil giant, but how much did we ever generate from oil? The highest we had ever generated as an oil producing nation was 35 billion. And still staying in West Africa, where the police command in Nasarawa State, Nigeria's North Central, has signed a peace agreement with the leaders of the People's Democratic Party and the All Progressives Congress in the state. This comes ahead of the anticipated judgment of the Supreme Court on the 2023 governorship election. During the signing of the peace pact in Lafia, the Commissioner of Police, Umaru Nadada, vowed to deal decisively with anyone who gets involved in any form of trouble during, before, or even after the judgment. Let's stay with politics as we head to southern Nigeria, where the Rivers House of Assembly has invited nine former commissioners who resigned from the state, Governor Siminalai Fubara, for fresh screening and confirmation. The nine commissioners resigned in December 2023 following a feud between Fubara and Yesom Wike, Minister of the Federal Capital Territory. Clerk of the Rivers House of Assembly, Emeka Amadi, in a statement on Monday, said the commissioner nominees are expected to appear before the lawmakers on Wednesday. Now, this development is part of the resolution reached after Fubara and Wike agreed to end the political feud when the president, Bola Tinobu, intervened. Wiki and other rivers stakeholders on December 18, 2023, signed eight-point resolution, which includes resubmitting the names of all commissioners and River State Executive Council who resigned the appointment due to the political crisis in the state to the House of Assembly for approval. And still in River State, the Supreme Court has reserved judgment in the appeal filed by the governorship candidate of the All Progressives Congress, Patrick Tonye Cole, against the victory of the River State Governor, Siminalai Fubara, in the March 18, 2023, governorship election. Mr. Tonyesko's case is a consequence of the appeal court decision of 28th November, which dismissed his appeal for lacking sufficient and convincing evidence. 
The APC governorship candidate's connection, contention rather, is that irregularities, non-compliance with the Electoral Act, and Fabara's continued signing of documents as the River State Accountant General as his nomination as the governorship candidate of the People's Democratic Party, PDP. A five-member panel headed by Justice Kudirat Kekereakon reserved judgment on the appeal after all parties in the suit adopted their briefs of argument. And let's also tell you that Hope Uzodima has been sworn in for a second term as the governor of Imo State following his re-election. He took the oath of office at the Dan Ayam Stadium in Oweri, the Imo State capital. The governor's inauguration came just minutes after Chinyiri Okomaru took her oath of office as the deputy governor of Imo State. President Bola Chinobo, former president Olushe Mwamba Sonjo, Senate President Gatsuil Akpabio, a Speaker of the House of Representatives Taju Dean Abbas, and other All Progressives Congress chieftains were among those in attendance. In his speech, the governor promised to exceed his performance in the first term, thanking the people of the state for their support. Nigeria's ruling party, the All Progressives Congress (APC), has described. A chieftain of the Labour Party, Prof. Pat Utomi, as a serial promoter of mega parties. The National Publicity Secretary of the Party, Felix Mocker, stated this in a statement issued on Monday while reacting to a statement credited to Utomi on a possible merger among the People's Democratic Party, PDP, Labour Party, LP, and the new Nigeria People's Party, NNPP, ahead of 2027. And now let's talk security matters. Increase in abductions, which has crippled social and economic activities in Nigeria's northwest, has now extended its grip nationwide. Now, bandits and criminal elements who used to operate on the highways and rural areas have shifted the operations into major cities like Lagos, Abuja, and other urban centers. An incident unfolded in the Zagwari estate layout in Dutsen Alhaji area, Buari area council of the Federal Capital Territory, Abuja, on Monday. The abduction of seven family members resulted in a tragic killing of four victims, intensifying public outrage. The bandits responsible for these heinous acts have demanded a staggering sum of 700 million naira for the release of the remaining captives, underscoring the gravity of the security crisis now infiltrating urban landscapes. The hoodlums on Friday killed Nabiha, and Kadria, when her father could not meet their demand, leaving her remaining sisters in captivity. And on to business related story. Inflation in Nigeria has risen to its highest rate in more than 27 years. Nigeria's Bureau of Statistics says the rate that prices were increasing over the year was up for the 12th straight month. On average, the price of goods has risen to just under 29% compared to a year ago. The statistics office says the rise in the cost of basic foodstuffs, including bread, fruit, and eggs, was higher. Analysts say higher fuel prices and a weaker currency, the Naira, have also contributed to the rise. When President Bola Chinobu took office last May, he immediately embarked on a series of bold economic reforms. The president scrapped a costly but popular fuel subsidy and the value of the currency to try to revive growth. Elial Akin Fatunke, a chartered accountant, spoke to us on these developments. We have set to 28.92%. So if you want to compare that to um, what we had in November, 28.2%, it has been on for 11 months. Uh, for statisticians, in fact, econometricians, uh, we knew this was going to happen in the back of weak currency, quite right, who are not earning enough. And the little that we were earning was uh, bedeviled, unfortunately, by the gulf that we had in the, in the trust deficit. 20% um, by way of Pareto analysis, unless uh, we're smiling to the banks without necessarily producing. And those bold reforms that you mentioned um, were not wholesomely embraced, one, 
And two, even those who you know, put the reforms there, well, in my mind, not a bit serious with the kind of discipline that needed to be seen um, from the driver of a vehicle uh, who has lost a tire. Uh, something needed to, to have a given. And to talk about the rise in abductions in Nigeria, I've been joined live on the news by Tani Mola Kolade, a digital communications consultant. Good afternoon. Glad to have you join me. Yeah, good afternoon. Now, how has the escalation... I can hear you, yes. Um, I'm asking, how has the escalation of abductions uh, shifting from the northwest region to major cities like Lagos, Abuja, and even other urban centers impacted the overall security landscape in Nigeria? Well, thank you. I, for me, I feel the, the increase of kidnappings from like the outskirts to the urban areas can actually be linked to overall security apparatus that we have around the country and lack of synergy between security agencies. And the fact that mostly on the highways, we've noticed there are some spots that have increased, increased security presence. And I feel these kidnappers are becoming more sophisticated and audacious. That is why they can actually come into the urban areas, pick up people en masse, and also escape with them without little or no interference from the security agencies. And while others might probably put it that, yes, there is actually a problem with the economic state of people right now. So that's basically it. Beyond the uh, sophistication you know, of arms, which you mentioned, and also you talked about unemployment, what factors might be contributing to this expansion of criminal activities? Yes, it, it's all about making money the easy way. Because imagine if you are employed, I have to wait for a month to take your salary ranging, let's say, between 50000 to 100000 And the fact that, okay, when there's a kidnapping, they start asking for millions of naira in foreign currencies too. And I feel the, sorry to say, the media hyping is also an issue. Because the, the, the moment you give these people more air time to actually showcase what they do, showcasing, yeah, means like the reporting. People out there see that, okay, somebody's kidnapping, somebody are asking for 100 million, asking for 200 million, and people are paying. And the next thing they will see it as a lucrative business. Like if I may just quickly the jump days, in if there. I die, I die. Yes, if I may just quickly jump in there, Tani Mola, when you say media hyping, it is the duty of the media to bring to fore issues ravish, you know, ravaging the nation. Yeah, I, I totally understand it, the detail of the media, but sometimes I feel there are certain things that should not even be brought to the limelight. Okay, an example was the recent case in Abuja, the Nabia issue, and the former minister for communications, Issa Pantami, came online to say, okay, I have a friend that is bringing up 50 million to help these people out, and the next thing, definitely, this kid has the, the, the make use of different social media platforms and the read uh, news. And they say this kind of thing, I'm like, oh, so is this easy to get somebody to? Because which I felt there are certain information that should not even make it to the media space. Why I'm just basically saying that some certain aspects of these things have to be censored. Same way the police or the security agencies will tell you that, okay, their strategies are actually being kept up the social media space. So that's basically it. I'm not saying it is wrong for the media to bring back. I feel to an extent it has to be censored. Certain parts has to be censored away to not make kidnapping look lucrative for others. All right. Thank you so much for your insight on the news. Tani Mola Kolade, a digital communications consultant. And now let's talk about um, health-related matters. In the wake of the Dangote refineries move into diesel and aviation fuel production, Health experts are voicing apprehension over potential health and environmental hazards associated with refinery operations. The commencement of the diesel and aviation fuel production at the Dangote refinery 
has sparked many reaction as critical stakeholders are also saying this might be the catalyst to have the Nigerian refineries revived and revamped. It was earlier reported that the Dangote Petroleum Refinery was set to start producing automotive gas oil, also known as diesel, and Jet A1 or aviation fuel in January 2024, while the production of petrol was being delayed by the supply of crude oil in installment. While commending the Dangote refinery strides in diesel and aviation fuel production, health experts are sounding a cautionary note emphasizing the need to address potential health and environmental hazards associated with refinery operations. Earlier, Dr. Lars Ude Eze, founder of Talk Health Niger, spoke to us on these developments. Uh, the Dangote refinery have started operations. Uh, from that perspective, it's believed that it's going to create jobs and make the products more available. But of course, as you mentioned, uh, it raised significant health concerns uh, when the picture uh, of the refinery shows significant presence of gas flaring. You know, uh, that's kind of got me worried. Um, there is plethora of evidence uh, that shows that gas flaring is inimical to the environment, it releases toxic gases, and that contributes to climate. You're watching News Central now. Let's take a short break. Stay with us. CEO for Brain and Spine is advocating more government attention and investment in neurological health care in Nigeria. Now, stakeholders say they regretted that the near neglect of the neurological health care in the country was a reflection of the broader neglect of the health care ecosystem as a whole. The group therefore called on well-to-do Nigerians to consider directly a portion of their philanthropic effort towards initiatives that focus on neurological health care. And still on the health, but this time in neighboring Republic of Benin, where we understand that the country has received its first doses of vaccine for malaria, the leading cause of infant mortality in the country, and will begin administering these doses very soon. Now, Health Minister Benjamin Huskampton told journalists that malaria remains endemic and represents the leading cause of death among children under five years of age in the country. According to the minister, the first vaccinations will take place within a few months. In the Republic of Benin, 40% of outpatient consultations and 25% of hospital admissions are linked to malaria. An immunization specialist at the UNICEF office in the country, Benin, told journalists that the vaccine will immunize around 200,000 children under two years of age. The government officially received 215,900 doses of the RTSS vaccine late on Monday. In southwest Nigeria, the Lagos State Environmental Protection Agency has urged more lovers to consider reducing their consumption to keep the air quality of the state clean and healthy. In a recent interview, the general manager of the agency, Babatunde Ajayi, says burning of cow skin in different areas of Nigeria's economic nerve center releases carbon emissions into the air, which are very harmful to humans. Betsuna Willy reports. Pomo is made by burning cow skin, and this involves burning the cow skin for an extended time on fire before it reaches the perfect texture. Thereafter, the roasted skin is washed several times and boiled for several hours to soften it. Turkey chicken are very, very expensive. So if they are buying them, burning them, pomo now. So how are we going to be eating pomo when people don't even have, in this country now, people don't even have a lot of money to buy turkey, even they are going to uh, buy chicken. How does pomo actually affect the cost of food? How does it improve, it improve the security situation in the country? You understand? I just, I just feel they're just, this government are just doing, they're just acting scenes and drama to just be relevant in the media. Some people believe it's not nutritious, but to me, it depends on the one you are buying. 
because we have so many different kinds of pomo and different processes in making pomo. We have some that is being processed with chemical. Speaking against the backdrop of the data on air quality that the state agency released, which showed that it was below healthy, the general manager of the Lagos State Environmental Protection Agency, Babatsunde Ajayi, says agricultural emission contributes to poor air quality. The data by La Sepa across the 22 areas measured found that the air quality in those areas ranged from moderate to unhealthy, with Agege, Akoka, Ojo, and Ketu topping the list of areas with the unhealthiest air quality. It's quite responsible for the weather change that we're experiencing these days. We, when it's cold, it's extremely cold. When it's hot, it's extremely hot. Uh, you are seeing rain in January, you know. So that's basically what you call climate change. And burning of Omo, uh, you know, actually came out um, as one big central issue. Um, uh, uh, well, the, one of the reasons why you do measurement, uh, like the Lagos State government actually did, is for you to begin to note where you have the, where the effect is largely coming from. According to the World Future Council, modern agriculture, food production and distribution are major contributors of greenhouse gases. Agriculture is directly responsible for 14% of total greenhouse gas emissions and broader rural land use decisions have an even larger impact. This includes animal farming, particularly the processing of hides and skin. Momo is in that category of having collagen and not having the essential vitamins and minerals, thus making it a food of low nutritional value. Like where else can you get collagen from? You can actually get from other food sources that come with that full package of having added nutritional value. The state government had earlier called on residents of the state to be cautious and make conscious choices as data reveals moderate and unhealthy air quality index in some parts of the state. For lovers of Pomo, the forfeiture of the delicacy may just be the price to pay for a better living. In Lagos for New Central, Bettina Nwili. In an era dominated by digital distractions and rapid technological advancement, the state of a nation's reading culture serves as a critical indicator of its intellectual development and societal progress. Nigeria, with its rich history, diverse cultures and vibrant population, stands at a crossroad when it comes to fostering a robust reading culture. Now, this report by Ni Omoni focuses on a book-based library and resource center recently created in Lagos aimed to rekindle the nation's passion for reading. His report. Nigeria currently has one of the lowest reading rates in the world, according to a 2018 report by the National Bureau of Statistics. The report found that only 10% of Nigerian adults read for pleasure weekly. Literacy rates also remain low, with only 62% of Nigerian adults able to read and write. To address these and complement effort by the government, the Committee for Relevant Art created this library, which provides free access to books and resource materials. The, the idea for having um, resource centers where on a very regular basis people come and there's an author and there's a book and they discuss it is something that we, we consider very germane to the improvement of the Nigerian literacy. We seem to have a problem <laughs> in Nigeria, in Africa. And uh, when you try to dissect it, you get to the root of it all, you find out that uh, it's all related to lack of knowledge. Experts believe that if centers like these are encouraged, it will boost learning process and of course the reading culture in Nigeria. As you can see, it is quite a developing place, but a lot of categories are here from fiction to poetry and even a children's book. I myself have picked interest in this book, Iriki Unibudo by Dio Fagoa. If you read, if you're politically aware, you must know that this is inimical to your development and growth. 
this is what this resource center will do for you. Because as you read, you will have more confidence in your culture because we are the greatest people on the face of the earth. We are breeding a generation of illiterates. Not just in terms of reading, but mentally illiterate. Incapable of retaining a concept in their mind, not even for one microsecond. One of the solutions to this is institutions for this. Then we find ways of attracting them away from their lazy encounter in the world of narrative. This was it in the 70s, you know, 80s. You know, libraries were the go-to places. You know, but all of a sudden they just disappeared, like cinemas disappeared and so many things disappeared. Um, so I think it's going to look like an intrusion. And then after a while, I'm hoping that people will get used to it. There is also the role of parents in rekindling the reading and learning culture among youth. I know that some people might not be visual readers, so maybe the, what you can do first is introduce them to comics and then gradually like, introduce them to books as well. They are the leaders of tomorrow. Without our support, they will not grow. They will fall out of the path. Supporters of the initiative say that improved access to learning courses, especially in rural areas, could help boost literacy rates and develop a new generation of readers and lifelong learners in Nigeria. They argue this is crucial for the country's social and economic development. In Lagos, for New Central, Ni Omani. Coming up, Mauritius raises cyclone alerts to maximum. We'll bring you details of these and more when we return. Stay with us. Thank you for staying tuned. African National Congress ANC senior member Uncle Sazani Delamini Zuma has expressed her intention to retire from parliament. Delamini Zuma has served as a member of cabinet since 1994 and held various positions during her time. The former wife of Jacob Zuma announced her retirement in a letter written to ANC electoral committee head. Higalema Mothalente and ANC Secretary General Fikile Mbalula and declined an invitation to attend an interview for the 2024 National List, which was scheduled, scheduled to take place. The Laminini Zuma served as the first woman to chair the African Union Commission, formerly known as the Organization for African Unity. Meanwhile, it is left to be seen if Unko Sazana de Lamini Zuma will campaign for ANC in the upcoming elections. And to talk about this, I'm joined live on the news by Dr. Sokozani Chilenga Butau, lecturer, political studies at Wits University. Good afternoon from here. Glad to have you join me. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. It's election year and the ANC has been hit by yet another setback. In your view on retirement, uh, what do you make of Uncle Susanna de Lamini and how will these affect ANC in the upcoming elections? To be honest, I think that Dr. Zamini Zuma has had quite a long time in the political arena, be it through the African Union or through the African National Congress, as you alluded to in your introduction. And for me, it comes as no surprise that she would like to retire, especially given that in the 2017 election, when she went up against the current uh, President Ramaphosa for uh, President of the African National Congress, she faced a lot of criticism and unfair bias for being the former wife of the former President Zuma. And so for me, it comes as no surprise that she is bowing out of politics and resigning uh, because of the treatment she has received, which she has said in interviews is quite unfair uh, because she, is she was married to a former president. 
but also because her achievements don't seem to be recognized in their own standing and in their own right. But then what are the possibilities of Uncle Susanna joining another organization? I mean, we've seen her almost twice in Parliament, the fine parties and structures uh, during the Pala Pala case. And also all indications show that she is against her party. That's what the indications might show, but actually on the ground, it appears as though she is against particular factions within the ANC, meaning that she disagrees with certain party lines and certain leaders or ideologies within the ANC. I highly doubt that she will join another political party, given that she appears to to want to serve South Africa either in a ministerial position within the ANC or just to continue with work that she's been doing on the continent. However, in the context of uh, the former President Jacob Zuma decampaigning the ANC and a resignation from uh, the party stalwart Mavusum Simang and then the withdrawal of that resignation, we are not sure whether she would be the person to join another party. Of course, we can't say 100%, but I doubt her resignation is either to join another party or to decampaign the ANC. It appears that she is just done with politics and she's ready to, to move on. All right, Dr. Chilenga, let's talk a bit about her trajectory. Uh, we know that she has had some great successes in the cabinet. Uh, what role do you think uh, she can play, uh, for instance, in the state of politics in South Africa, as voters are looking for real change in the upcoming elections? One of the things that uh, Dr. Jamini Zuma can do is to try bring in uh, voters who have become apathetic as a result of uh, many missteps by the party. So, for instance, one thing that I would like to see her do is appeal to women voters, especially given the levels of gender-based violence in South Africa, and given the fact that she is currently in a position uh, in cabinet where she deals with a portfolio of women, youth, and people with disabilities. You don't have to be a card-carrying member of a political party to do that work where you just say to voters, look, vote in your best interest, but make sure that you vote. Uh, she was quite good as Minister of Health, and so it will be really good for her to champion issues in the health space, especially given that South Africa passed the National Health Insurance Bill, uh, a few uh, months ago in 2023. And so it will be interesting for her to give her perspective on how she thinks the National Health Service in general, but also alongside that bill, could be improved in both her view as a medical doctor and in her view as a former uh, cabinet member. I think that would be very effective uh, to use that um, line of thinking or that approach to voters. And now that she's resigning and stepping outside of uh, parliament, she could get, give a very informed view on those two issues. Okay, just to follow up a bit on the National Health Insurance Bill you made reference to, which part of this bill do you think is needing urgent attention in terms of reforms? I think that the funding model is what is coming under fire um, in terms of political, I beg your pardon, in terms of public discourse. A lot of people are worried that the funding that will be allocated to the National Health Insurance and the National Health Service will quite frankly be looted. People are skeptical that government will actually use money to improve the health service. On the other hand, uh, the private sector uh, doesn't want its um, patients, its fee-paying patients to be drawn away from its services. And the quality and the difference or the difference in the quality of services between the private and the public sector is so stark that you can imagine that the private sector would either not want to be uh, burdened as the public health uh, system is 
or would not want to have any of its funds allocated to a public fund. But the fact of the matter is whichever side of the spectrum you're on in terms of supporting the national health insurance or supporting public health care, I mean, sorry, private health care in South Africa, the status quo cannot continue as it is. The public service needs a lot of work to be improved for the majority of South Africans to have access to quality health care and the private sector also needs to be held accountable for some of its practices towards private healthcare patients. Dr. Chilenga, thank you so much for your insight on the news. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you for having me. Kenya's Foreign Minister, Mosalia Modavadi, has called for a swift resolution of a diplomatic dispute over a flight banned by Tanzania on flag carrier Kenya Airways. Tanzania on Monday imposed a ban that halted passenger flights between Nairobi and Dar es Salaam, raising concerns among citizens of the two countries about escalating tensions between the East African neighbors. Modavadi said after discussion with his Tanzanian counterpart, Bakamba, they have agreed that their respective civil aviation authorities will work together to have the matter resolved amicably within the next three days. The sudden ban arose from a disagreement over cargo flight operations. Tanzania sought approval for all cargo flights by Air Tanzania to Nairobi, but Kenyan authority denied this request, citing technical and logistical concerns. Mauritius raised the cyclone warning alert, alert to maximum on Tuesday and told eight inhabitants to stay indoors, but said tropical storm Belal was moving away from the Indian Ocean Island nation. According to Mauritius Meteorological Service, MMS, in a statement, gusts of wind up to around 120 kilometers an hour were hitting the remote island. Belal has already battered the French overseas territory of Reunion, leaving one person dead. The MMS said a cyclone class one in four, the maximum level, was now in force on the island. The magnets for tourists attracted by its stunning white beaches and crystal clear waters. The statement advised the public to maintain all precautions and remain indoors. You're watching News Central now. Still ahead. Donald Trump celebrates Iowa win. We have details of these coming up shortly. Join us again. And outside the African continent, Donald Trump delivered a speech following his win at the Iowa caucuses, vowing to solve Russia's war on Ukraine and the Israel-Hamas war, as well as seal up the border between the U.S. and Mexico and expand oil and gas drilling. Donald Trump also told Americans it was time for the country to come together after he won the Iowa caucuses, cementing his status as the likely Republican challenger to take on President Joe Biden in November's election. The former president has led polling for more than a year, but the Republican contest was seen as the clearest insight yet into whether he can convert his advantage into a stunning White House return. Rough on the president, but I have to say that he is the worst president that we've had in the history of our country. He's destroying our country. So, Russia would have never attacked, Israel would have never been attacked. The Ukraine situation is so horrible, the Israeli situation is so horrible. What's happened? And, uh, we're going to get himself. We're going to get himself very fast. I actually said, you can come together. We're going to drill, baby, drill right away. Yeah. Drill, baby, drill. We're going to seal up the border. Yeah. Because right now we have an invasion. We have an invasion.
East Africa's air travel landscape faces turbulence as Tanzania retaliated against Kenya's decisions to bar Air Tanzania from its airspace by grounding all Kenya Airways flights to Dar es Salaam. Now, this tit for tat move, effective January 22, 2024, escalated a simmering dispute between the two East African nations over landing rights and air travel regulations. Kenya Airways operates 33 scheduled flights per week between Nairobi and Dar es Salaam, a crucial route for business and tourism in both countries. The Tanzanian Civil Aviation Authority, TCAA, announced a suspension citing the Kenyan government's unilateral decision to deny landing permits to Air Tanzania flight on January 16th. And now to sports stories. It's all set for Bafana Bafana to begin their 2023 Africa Cup of Nations campaign when they face Mali in an opening Group E match with the Tunisia taking on Namibia while Burkina Faso will battle it out with Mauritania. Bafana are the third high-ranked team in Group E behind Tunisia and Mali while Namibia make up the group. Meanwhile, Southern African fans have all their hopes pinned on South Africa and Namibia to work some magic in their encounters this evening. Meanwhile, this will be the first encounter between Tunisia and Namibia at the CAF Africa Cup of Nations. They last, they last faced each other in November 2007 in a friendly match Tunisia won 2-0. And to talk about this, I've been joined live on the news by Peter Kanjere, who joins us from Malawi. Good afternoon from here. Glad to have you join me. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Now, let's talk about the mental capacity for Namibia, as well as South Africa at the AFCON, to actually put themselves out there and maybe, you know, bring the trophy to Southern Africa? Because, I mean, we've seen uh, Mozambique and Angola playing very well. What do you make of that? If you talk about the mental capacity of let me start with Namibia, I think it's a tough task for them because, uh, let's face it, uh, they have drawn most of their players from South Africa, most of them small teams, second-tier league teams, and most of them are also from the domestic league, and their star player, and and their star player is the uh, Peter Shalulide who plays for Mamelodi um, Sundowns. So I think for them it's a question of uh, of uh, gaining the experience because they haven't been there for a long time. But let's talk maybe about more about South Africa because South Africa are returning to Africa uh, after having missed the 2019 edition and indeed the 2021 edition. Um, on the paper, you say France says South Africa's chances, they are in a group comprising Mali and Tunisia, and they start the race with Mali. So if you look at the performance of uh, Bafana Bafana in the last 10, year, 10 games, they look very promising because they have only uh, lost once. And uh, also, most of their players are coming from Mamelo Sundown, which is currently ranked number one. So they do have that experience in goals. They have just won a uh, uh, player like Ronwen Williams for Sundowns, has won the African uh, uh, League with Sundowns. The same thing, if you talk about uh, up front, you have Peseta, who is doing well at the uh, in Egypt. So South Africa look on paper to be promising, and they also have a coach who knows how to win it. Remember that the coach, you Gross, won the Afcon with Cameroon with a relatively inexperienced squad. He dropped most of the stars, but he went on to win this. So South Africa, in terms of the mental capacity, I would think they look uh, promising on paper because they have experienced players. Tau won the CAF Champions League with Sundowns and also with uh, Alahri. Ayanda Sugu has played in Russia, has played at the highest level in uh, South Africa, super sport. So these are, uh, then you have Zwan is there, uh, who is doing quite well as a playmaker for Sundown. So I, I expect South Africa to use the experience from these players drawn from the clubs such as the Sundowns uh, to translate international team. 
All right, thank you so much for your time on the news. Peter Kanjere, all the way from Malawi. Thank you so much. Thank you. And now let's move on to another story. It's a wrap on the news, but thank you so much for joining us at this hour. But before we go, let's take a look again at some of the major stories. World Economic Summit has kicked off in Davos, Switzerland. UK Parliament set for hot debate on Rwanda asylum plan. Kenya seeks sweet resolution with Tanzania after flight ban. Send your eyewitness report to the WhatsApp number on the screen and follow us on social media. We are at News Central TV. You can watch us live on DSTV channel 422, Star Times channel 274, Avo TV and YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I am Adebola Adeduba.